murder is the ultimate crime. So as soon as we get that remit to, to catch the murderer, we cannot afford to let anyone go. And you cannot have murderers walking around the street. Traditionally, with a murder, you may have an eyewitness, you may have CCTV, or you may have forensic evidence. In this case, as it developed over the first week, we were getting no forensic evidence whatsoever. I think the perpetrators in this case thought that they definitely had pulled off the perfect murder. I think they thought that they were going to get away with it. For anybody to find a body is traumatic, but for a mother to find her son beggars belief on how that must have felt. They were well aware of forensics. They had gone prepared with a view to avoiding detection. You try and switch off after you finish, although you can't. You're always looking for, have I done everything? Has everything been done? It's a massive responsibility to catch a killer. On September the 30th, 2009, the body of a man was discovered in a house in a rural market town. So it was a Thursday afternoon and I'd been on a senior detectives conference. I was just travelling back to Norfolk with my deputy uh, and as we drove along the A14, we received a call to say that a body had been found in suspicious circumstances at Fakenham. When we get a call that there's a body, the first thing we're listening for or to find out is whether it's suspicious or not. The early information was that he'd been stabbed. You don't get stabbed through natural causes. The victim was 45-year-old Stephen Murphy, who was discovered in his own home. Stephen Murphy was found by his mother. That's quite unforgettable and that's quite poignant. For anybody to find a body is traumatic, but for a mother to find her son um, beggars belief on how that must have felt. Stephen had been found at the far end of the hall away from the front door. Mum had arrived to bring back some laundry that she'd done for him, pushed the door and saw Stephen dead on the floor at the other end of the hallway with blood around him. She had called the police who had attended and then taken her home. I can't think of anything more powerful as an image of a, of a mother finding her own son uh, stabbed to death in the hallway of his house. It's something that would resonate with absolutely everyone. I arrived here about 6 p.m., so it was just getting towards dusk. I attended with my deputy and went to the scene to discuss what was being found. Stephen had 16 stab wounds. Um, later interpretation of that indicated that he was probably stabbed shortly after the assailants came into the house. He may have tried to get away from them and then fell to the floor at the end of the hallway and was then stabbed further whilst lying on the floor. The front door had been left ajar. It's possible that a postman had poked some letters through the door. What we didn't have was a time of death at that point. Rigor mortis had set in, which indicates that the body had been there for a little while. So it's not something fresh. In this quiet town, the police activity soon attracted the attention of the local press. When we first heard that a body had been found, obviously we, the immediate response for a, a reporter is to head out to the, to the scene. The very quiet cul-de-sac, a residential area, nothing remarkable about it at all, except for the fact that there was now you know, forensic examination going on, people with white suits and a black tarpaulin across the front of the house where the entrance to the house would have been. Stephen was still in situ at the end of the hallway had probably been pursued down the hall and maybe tried to protect himself on the floor. And there was a glove mark on the wall just above him, indicating that someone was leaning over him. Certainly from the angle of some of the wounds, one was in his 
backside, um, it looked as if he was attacked from above as he lay on the floor. What makes this case interesting is that it's a very violent blitz attack on a man but it doesn't fall into the category of a domestic homicide. And it doesn't seem to fall into the category of kind of a random attack either. But in the immediate hours that followed with the finding of the body, it was difficult to understand who would have been the suspect. With any murder, there is a golden time. That first 12 hours is critical. So we need to get as much information as possible from anywhere and everywhere um, surrounding that, those circumstances. Stephen had been stabbed and there is a possibility that his assailant may have discarded the weapon when leaving the scene. We were looking down drains, we were looking under hedges, we were looking in rubbish bins, we were looking in gardens, anywhere where someone could have discarded the weapon. No weapon was found. In this instance, there was very little obvious forensics coming through. So we had to look at other places and victimology is a key line of inquiry. More often than the case is the murderer has met the victim at some stage or has some connection with the victim. You tend to start with Stephen in the middle and build concentric circles around Stephen and gradually widen the people that you look at. So you look at those closest friends, family, uh, acquaintances and then identifying people that may be of interest to you. Our research into Stephen established that he had moved from Southampton into the area fairly recently. As far as we could establish, he didn't know anyone else in the area at all. It was just mum and stepfather. At the scene, a local police officer gave Jez one vital piece of information about Stephen's personal life. Stephen had been seeing a lady and there had been a problem with another man in the town uh, about uh, that relationship. The other man was a lorry driver from Felixstowe named James Cameron. There had been a problem between James Cameron and Stephen. This had previously led to violence and James had made an allegation against Stephen that uh, he had been attacked and cut with a knife. That was still being investigated at the time and there had been some criminal damage previously. So clearly there was a potential person of interest and we needed to know where James Cameron was. Hoping to find out more about Stephen and this relationship, Jez went to visit his mother at her home. It wasn't a case of breaking the news to mum, which can be very emotional. She was aware and probably in shock following her discovery. We needed to engage with her to get information from her uh, to build a history of, around Stephen that we could then start breaking into and, and breaking up piece by piece and working on. I always become emotionally involved when I'm with the family. It's very difficult not to be because the emotions that are running round. I don't normally make promises, but uh, I did say to her that I would find out what had happened and get a result for her. I really felt that she needed something to hang on to. She was really very, very upset and clearly very close to Stephen. And um, I just felt the need to reassure her. On Stephen's street, the search for witnesses continued. It's one of those towns that everybody knows everybody. So we all assumed at that point that someone must know something within Fakenham. House to House inquiries identified that some neighbours about three doors down had left their home just at the end of an episode of EastEnders, I believe. And as they did so, saw two figures outside the front door of Stephen's house. They didn't recognise them, they didn't actually see their faces, but they remember seeing two people in that area. And having just watched something specific on television, you had a time. 
People said that they saw two men standing at his door and that was pretty much all the information the police had to go on. Whoever did it was planning really carefully how they were going to commit this murder so they didn't leave any evidence behind. At Stephen's house, forensic officers had sealed off the area in order to secure the crime scene from contamination. It was just over here at the gate where I met the crime scene manager and discussed what he had found inside. Just over the porchway, there was a tarpaulin to protect the scene, and it was under the porchway that we found the footprint in blood. So we had the footprint analysed by an expert who identified it as size 12 in a particular type of shoe. So we knew that we would be looking for that type of shoe if we came across someone that we thought was involved in the actual murder. What was really odd was there was no forensic evidence or no blood, nothing else between Stephen and the front door, just the footmark outside the door. Later in the inquiry, we discussed it as a team and I actually put a little prize up for anyone who could come up with a theory as to how someone could be involved in that and only leave this blood mark outside the front door and not leave anything in between. I think the police would have been very frustrated immediately when they look for forensic evidence. So straight away, they haven't got that ability to kind of check for DNA in their DNA database. Also the fact that there was very little that they could go on in terms of who is this man. So it meant that they had to really start to plan out where are they going to get information from? How are they going to solve this? And that involves good old fashioned policing. With the crime scene and local information providing no clues as to what had happened, at the end of the first 24 hours, Jez and his team had no evidence to help solve this brutal murder. It was an unusual case. I mean, Norfolk is a safe place to live. So to have anyone stabbed in Norfolk and die is very rare and obviously very frightening. Murder is the ultimate crime. So as soon as we get that remit to catch the murderer, the pressure is on and the victims' families, they need to know, they need justice, they need to know what's happened. Stephen Murphy had been stabbed 16 times in his home. In the day since his mother had discovered his body, the sleepy Norfolk town of Fakenham had become the centre of a murder inquiry. There is no such thing as an easy or a simple murder inquiry. They're all difficult because the pressure, the, the responsibility is huge. The beginning of the investigation is really resource intensive. With everyone that was involved, we were looking at probably around 70 people. With no forensic evidence and no local leads, the team began to broaden their inquiries. We had identified that Stephen had moved to the area from Southampton and he'd had a bit of a checkered history in Southampton. He spent some time in prison for a drug offences, I think, and he'd come up to Norfolk for a fresh start, effectively, to try and start a new life up in, in Norfolk, in Fakenham. It was always possible that having been brought up to Norfolk by his family, he had left either a debt or some sort of grievance with someone in Southampton. So we need to identify whether there was anyone in Southampton who may have come up to Norfolk to kill Stephen. Their only lead so far had been the man Stephen had had an altercation with, lorry driver James Cameron. It's an obvious line of inquiry, um, an associate or um, someone he's had altercations with. Inquiries established that he was in Scotland and it was important to bottom out an alibi that he might have to eliminate him from uh, the inquiry. But he was not even in the country at the time. He was visiting family um, up in Scotland, which was verified by detectives. Jez still wanted to question James Cameron, and five days after the murder, he was handed an opportunity to do just that. Mr. Cameron, as it happens, was coming back to Fakenham because he had relatives in the town and there was a family celebration that weekend that he was going to attend. So he flew into Norwich Airport and we 
interviewed Mr Cameron at quite some length and we asked him to account in great detail for his movements and about the history between himself and Stephen. Although James Cameron was in the clear, the team still wanted to do some more digging into his connections with Stephen Murphy. We didn't have enough to arrest James at that time, but we seized his mobile phone. Because we seized it, we gave him another phone to replace it. We looked at the call data on that. We identified that almost as soon as James left the voluntary interview, he made one call to a telephone number and that telephone then became dead. There was no further call data on that phone at all. The number James Cameron had called was that of an unidentified pay-as-you-go phone. It was another dead end. When James had finished the interview, he returned to Scotland. That alibi was, was tight, so although the avenue opened, it was closed down again quite rapidly. At this point, the inquiry refocused on Stephen's movements in the 48 hours leading up to his murder. CCTV is brilliant. It does what it says on the, on the tin. It's, it's there in black and white or in colour. Very rarely in focus, but it's there. So you can't argue with it. Some of the best evidence is CCTV. The problem is finding it. So this is Fakenham Town Centre. We'd seized all the CCTV from the town centre at the time of the murder. We never knew whether it would be any use, when we could use it. Once we've got all that, then the nightmare starts because you can only view it in real time. Otherwise, you'll miss something. So then it's bums on seats, screens in front of you, trawling through CCTV in real time to see if we could find or glean any information. In this case, we didn't know what we were looking for. That is really time consuming and a vast amount of uh, staff hours. We looked at the movements of Stephen during the day and we identified that he had a meeting with his solicitor in Kings Lynn, that he had then gone to a pub, had a drink and a chat before getting on the bus back to Fakenham. We think he arrived in Fakenham possibly around about six o'clock he went to another pub in the town. Stephen needed to be home by eight o'clock because he had a curfew from a previous incident. So he knew that he got home around about quarter to eight. Within a couple of weeks of the body being found, the police had released a piece of CCTV showing Stephen in Kings Lynn, where he had been the day before he was killed what the police were hoping for was that it might illuminate some kind of interaction or discussion that he'd had with someone the day before he was killed, but really couldn't find anyone who knew him well enough to be able to tell us any more about him. The intelligence team spent weeks searching CCTV, hoping to see Stephen and anyone he may have been with in the 48 hours before his death, but found nothing locally, so continued to look into his links with Southampton. We spent a lot of time looking into Stephen's history, known associates uh, in the area, um, the drug scene. Every avenue we were exploring, we were coming to an end. It was fine, we were getting nowhere. Um, the doors were slamming in our faces on, on every line we, we did in Southampton. With no strong leads, the intelligence team tried a new tactic to try and establish a link between Southampton and Fakenham on the night of the murder. There's a classic route between Southampton and Norfolk, so using Police National Computer and the automatic number plate recognition system, AMPR, we trawled all the vehicles that had travelled from Southampton um, to Norfolk over a short period of time relevant to that murder. We would get all that information, all those vehicles, and there was probably a couple of hundred who at that time travelled from Southampton to Norfolk and from Norfolk to Southampton. So we're then left with a large list of vehicles that need to be looked at, why they travelled, why they were here. Over the next six weeks, a small team of officers trawled through this list, 
linking cars to names and addresses that they could involve in the inquiry. We had contacted the vehicle drivers to establish the purpose of their journey and whether there was any uh, connection between them and Stephen and it effectively eliminated them from the inquiry. And uh, we had spoken to most of his associates in Southampton and accounted for their whereabouts and the fact that they were still in Southampton. So that part of the inquiry was really drying up. People were talking to us in Southampton. The people on the drug scene were talking to us, giving alibis, which matched up. That's when it starts to get um, worrying. Um, because your avenues are closing. It had been several months since the murder, and without new information, Jez and the team were no closer to finding the killer. As we eliminated the possibility of someone coming from Southampton, we appeared to have eliminated James Cameron. So there were difficult times, and you're just wondering where the next step forward is going to come but you, in a way you have to have a positive belief that you will find it eventually you just need to keep looking at the detail in a desperate search for new evidence the police began to involve the media more the family put up a £10,000 reward for information that could lead to Stephen's killer this was about three weeks after the um, after his body was found in order for someone to commit such a violent attack, normally there is a personal reason behind it. And so my gut feeling was there was a personal grudge in some way between the assailant and Stephen. Despite all the posters in the shops around Fakenham, despite the coverage on radio and TV in the newspapers, there were no new leads. £10,000 is a lot of money. It showed not just the family's clear affection for Stephen and their absolute um, desperation, but also it was a sign that the information wasn't coming forward as quickly as the police might, uh, might have hoped at this point. I always do my very best for a family, but I tried to I try not to make promises in case I can't keep them and certainly three months into this investigation when our leads seem to be drying up I was very conscious of the fact that I've made that promise and may not be able to fulfil it. The pressure is the family knowing what's happened and for them to have the information and for them to have justice. But there's also that pressure that there's a killer out there. You can't switch off. We're talking a murder. Three months after Stephen Murphy had been found dead by his mother, having been stabbed 16 times, Norfolk police had still made no progress in catching the killer. As we close down things, it becomes quite a challenge to try to, A, motivate the team to keep going, the pressure comes on not only from trying to get a result from the family, but then internal pressure within the organisation. I engaged with advisors who came to look and have a presentation on the inquiry and suggest, I think you need to look more deeply at James Cameron. Sometimes it's a case of re-looking at things in a different way. One of the altercations between James Cameron and Stephen Murphy involved um, Cap James Cameron sustaining a small cut to his hand um, from Stephen Murphy. That was dealt with by the local police. The altercation was that minor. It didn't even result in a conviction. As James Cameron had cropped up in Stephen's victimology, um, we trawl his information. We look at him, um, his vehicle, his phone, um, his address, his associates, etc. Part of the work that we did on that was to look again at the telephone data that had been recovered from James's phone. 
smartphones are very good because we can track them, we can glean information from them. That took a while to come in. It came in about the same time as the Southampton inquiries were coming to a close. In that information was a deleted text. Although you can delete information off any computer, it's still there. There were four deleted texts, one of which raised our eyebrows quite, quite sharply. On the phone we seized from James was a text on the night of the murder that said, good job, and then some swear words. It was a eureka moment getting that text. Having done a vast amount of work in Southampton and, and elsewhere, and those avenues being closed, and the fresh line of inquiry opening up, that got the pulses racing that you can't keep having these avenues closed. One of them has got to, got to be positive. We were confident that that was the positive line of inquiry that we needed, the one we were looking for. But it's not the phone that killed Stephen Murphy. It's, it's a person that's holding that phone. You have to put that phone in someone's hand. That was a line of inquiry again, was to find out which phone sent that text and then put that phone to someone. Analysis of the data revealed that the text had come from the same number James had called after his interview and that the phone was being used in Blackpool. That text message came from a mobile phone that we then attributed to his son, Andrew Cameron, who was in Blackpool. So by the time we had identified Andrew Cameron and put him to the phone that, following the interview, James Cameron had phoned and then had been discarded, and then identified that there had been regular calls between those phones, especially on the night of Stephen's murder. All these things came together. There was another phone that came into the inquiry, which was linked to Alex Dewar, who was a known associate of Andrew Cameron, and one of particular interest because of his violent history. Jez and the team now needed to track down Andrew Cameron and his friend Alex Dewar for questioning. We moved to Blackpool to carry out inquiries surrounding Andrew Cameron and Alex Dewar. At the time, Andrew Cameron wasn't there. He'd moved to Canada shortly after the murder of Stephen Murphy. Fortunately, before Andrew Cameron left for Canada, uh, he was bragging that he'd been to Norfolk and um, done someone over. Rules of being a murderer is, is don't brag about it because you'll get caught. It's as good as leaving a fingerprint. It's our dream. It's what we want, positive information. We'd leapt on that lock, stock and barrel to get that information, which, which obviously we did. Um, but Andrew Cameron himself, um, although he bragged about it, schoolboy error, um, was, wasn't there. It was essential for Andrew Cameron to be tracked down in Canada. He was quite prominent on Facebook, letting people know he was in Canada um, and had befriended um, quite a lot of people, females in particular, in Canada. I contacted most of his associates in Canada and told them that I was looking into Andrew Cameron. Quite rapidly got some responses off at least three of the females. One of the girls he'd spoken to gave quite a detailed description of how Andrew Cameron had shown her how he'd stabbed Stephen Murphy. This was information that we had never released. So we knew that information was genuine. As everything started to come together, there was a real energy about the inquiry. Everyone's spirits were lift. Everyone felt that really was starting to get somewhere. And what we needed to identify was where Andrew Cameron was by this time. We found out that he was actually on an aeroplane from Canada back to the UK. And so I dispatched a team down to Heathrow to meet him as he as he landed. We arranged a welcoming party for him at Heathrow. He was taken off the plane by the Met um, and he was arrested on landing in the UK for murder and brought to Norfolk for questioning. On the 27th of February 2010, five months after Stephen Murphy's murder, police interviewed Andrew Cameron. The Police and Criminal Evidence Act 
says that we must deal with him within 24 hours or release him. We had an interview plan and I listened in to the interviews. Despite whatever you see on TV, SIOs don't go into interviews and interview people. They have people that are expert in that and you overhear, you oversee. We've been hoping for some kind of breakthrough in this case for such a long time. But to hear that one of these arrests was made in Heathrow Airport for someone who the police had been working with their opposite numbers in Canada in trying to allow that arrest to happen was really surprising, very surprising. Norfolk police interviewed suspect Andrew Cameron about the murder of Stephen Murphy. He denied everything. They didn't have enough evidence to charge him, so he was released on bail. When we released Andrew from custody, it was important to focus our endeavours to build upon the evidence that we had. I didn't want to leave him out for too long in case he absconded. I flew over to Canada and spoke to three witnesses over there who were quite happy to give us the information in statement form um, with the help of the Canadian police. In obtaining these witness statements, we were already convinced that we had the right people. But what we were able to do was build that picture of what they had done, and it just continued to strengthen the case. The team now had three persons of interest. And although James Cameron had a seemingly watertight alibi, his son Andrew and friend Alex Dewar were prime suspects. Andy and the Intel team did a lot of work on the telephone numbers that were associated to them, and also having identified Dewar, identified the vehicle that Dewar drove. Despite being a very large man, he drove a little Ford car, K.A. There's a camera just outside Norfolk. It gives such a good picture that it can show us, as well as the registration number, but the occupants of the front. And so we were able to see that there were two people in this car that travelled from Blackpool to Norfolk. At this stage, phone inquiries were in its infancy, really. It's, it's come a long way. But whenever a phone goes through an area to what they call shake hands with the local radio mast or telephone mast to make that connection, we were able to download the data from these radio masts and confirm that Andrew Cameron's phone had travelled with that Ford KA belonging to Dewar from Blackpool to fake them in Norfolk at the relevant times for the murder. It's probably one of the first times, certainly in Norfolk, that this equipment was used successfully. In my mind's eye, I was thinking, this is looking good. This could bring this inquiry to a closure. The energy and the excitement that built from identifying the telephone data and the AMPI data, we were getting really excited and really confident that we had finally identified the people that had been involved in the murder. There's still a job to do there. The use of AMPR to track cars going to and from Norfolk was really important, but also really thorough. The police in this case did everything. They didn't leave any stone unturned. And that was because they had very little to go on. This would have taken a lot of police work, a lot of resources, a lot of manpower, a lot of time and energy. Andrew Cameron was still out on bail, so it was essential for Jez and his team to gather more evidence as quickly as possible. I made a decision to release Andrew Cameron from custody on bail so that we could continue our inquiries and build our case and identify other people involved, etc. As it happened, Alex Dewar, since the murder of Stephen Murphy, had been involved in a totally separate incident in Blackpool and had been arrested and imprisoned for a very serious, uh, grievous bodily harm with intent. And so Alex Dewar was in Preston Prison. Alex Dewar was interviewed extensively, and I think he went no comment uh, to all questions. At the same time, we needed to look at where he lived and carry out a search of that address. 
and during the search of that address we found a trainer that was of the same type that made the footprint at the scene at Stephen Murphy's house. Although there was a match on the footprint, there was no DNA or physical match from the scene. So that's a small piece in the jigsaw. None of the defendants admitted to being involved in the killing, nor to being involved in the planning of the events that led to the death. Denials were made of any involvement at all. When Alex Jewell was returned to prison after the no comment interviews he'd made to police, he asked to make a phone call. What in fact he did was phone James Cameron, hoping that he would pass information on to Andrew, in which he implicated himself further in the murder of Stephen Murphy. The team examined Andrew Cameron and Alex Dewar's movements at the time of the murder and found a record of a bank transaction in Fakenham. We were able to identify the use of a cash point that was outside the bank just down here. And it was on this camera up here that we caught an image of Dewar and Cameron as they walked up the path back towards their car. And that was around about half an hour before we believe the murder occurred. There was a huge surge of enthusiasm, a real commitment from staff to secure the evidence we needed to get to charging and then have a successful case of court. And it was incredible the way things, one thing led to another. It's also important that you use that to trigger further response from the public. We actually did a media campaign in Blackpool and that reaped rewards because people started to contact us. And it turned out that Alex Dewar, at the time of Stephen Murphy's murder, was a student doing a criminology degree and was completely forensically aware. Hence, most likely, why there was no forensic evidence at the scene, because he knew what could be recovered and how to prevent it from being recovered. One of the features of the case which made it so difficult for the constabulary was that they were well aware of forensics, they had gone prepared with a view to avoiding detection, and indeed boasted subsequently to those to whom they spoke that they had gone, in their words, socked up. With Alex Dewar and Andrew Cameron linked to Fakenham, the team now only needed the last piece of the puzzle that would connect Andrew's father, James, to the killing. We did a search of Andrew Cameron's house. We found a computer and we seized and analysed the computer we identified that James Cameron in Scotland had made a phone call to Andrew Cameron in Blackpool. And exactly at the same time, on Andrew Cameron's computer, he had made a search for Fakenham and a route finder. And that's really the crucial evidence that led to the conspiracy charge for James. James Cameron had told his son that he'd been attacked and stabbed by Stephen Murphy. So Andrew Cameron decided to avenge his dad. Alex Dewar's involvement is he's someone who's got very violent tendencies. I just think he did it for the kicks. He went along with his friend to avenge his friend's dad because that's the only way he knew of resolving issues, and that was by using extreme violence. The police a long time to gather the evidence, uh, and of course, because some of it came from abroad, um, really detailed uh, efforts were needed to get that evidence into a form that could be admitted into trial here. Six months after the murder of Stephen Murphy, Jez and his team finally had enough to arrest and charge. Having taken the file to CPS, we were given permission to charge Andrew Cameron with murder, uh, Alex Dewar with murder, and James Cameron with conspiracy to commit grievous bodily harm. All three finally faced trial in November 2010. 
This is Norwich Crown Court. This is where Alex Dewar, Andrew Cameron and James Cameron were found guilty of murder and conspiracy to commit grievous bodily harm. This is where I was finally able to make good my promise that I would resolve the death of Stephen Murphy. This was a very difficult case, particularly for the police. And one has to bear in mind the reluctance of friends, of defendants, to speak openly about what has been said to them, particularly when those defendants have reputations for violence and indeed involving others who might be violent on their behalf. So there's a great deal of um, careful work needed by the police um, to give appropriate comfort and safety to those witnesses who were sufficiently brave to step forward. I was in court for the verdict. It had taken the jury longer to find uh, a decision on Alex Dewar for some reason than the other two. I've no real understanding of why they had a problem because all the evidence seemed to be pretty clear. After five weeks, the verdict was guilty for all three. It was quite an emotional day uh, because the fact that we'd reached um, such a positive result after such a long time. Andrew Cameron and Alex Dewar were both sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of Stephen Murphy, while James Cameron received 15 years for his part. It was a really difficult time for the family. The amount of time the investigation took to resolve. But eventually, I do feel that um, we were able to achieve justice for the family. But we can never replace Stephen. As murder inquiries go, this one was certainly one of the tough ones. It was a tough case. Um, but it was dealt with successfully, which makes it all worthwhile. I was really proud of our achievement on this investigation. It was really difficult. This investigation started in Fakenham, a small rural town in Norfolk. But it led us to Southampton, it led us to Blackpool, it led us to Scotland, it led us to Canada, and it really exploded and became so much more complicated than it might first have appeared. But the bottom line is we resolved all those issues and we were able to provide a result and a conclusion for the family. <laughs>